My name is Christian. I obviously work at CleverTap as a customer success manager. Uh, we have an amazing panel today, um, and they'll go through the in their introductions here shortly, but um, we can just go ahead and get started. So, uh, Stacy, go ahead. You can talk about who you are, your company, your role, and kind of what you do. So, I'm Stacy Earl. I am the uh, recently former uh, vice president of marketing and growth for Cardiogram. Uh, Cardiogram is a subscription heart health app. And um, I think that probably sums it up for me. I'll hand it over to Taylor. Cool. Uh, Taylor Gobar, she, they, head of marketing for her uh, queer dating app for women and gender expansive individuals. Joined in January. It's the best job ever. And happy pride to everyone who's here. I'm taking a brief pause from my like sparkle covered existence to talk about retention. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Sukriti. I work for Spotify. You might have heard of it. Um, <laughs> I work specifically on fan monetization, which is to help artists monetize beyond royalties. It's uh, we're using the Spotify platform. Hi, everyone. My name is Olar Kwan. I'm a co-founder and uh, head of growth for Goose Insurance. Uh, Goose is an insurance app for uh, Americans and Canadians uh, that you can buy the same way that you hail order, order your favorite sushi, or shop on your phone. Uh, you can also buy insurance for your personal needs uh, directly from mobile app, uh, our mobile app as well. Nice. Thanks for those introductions. Um, what's special about this panel is that every app here is a little bit different on how they engage with their users and how they retain their users. So I think it would be nice to go around the room and, and talk about uh, how do you define user engagement? How do you define user retention as it applies to your brand? So, you know, for me, user engagement, we're really paying attention to, you know, the key functions in the app and how they're being used and how frequently they're being used. Um, and then for us, we are a 30 day trial app. So 30 day trial, and then you go straight to subscription. Um, this is a recent change for us. We just this year changed our revenue model from freemium to premium only. So that was a big change that required a lot of engagement. And um, retention, because we're a subscription app, we're really just looking for people to continue their subscription and we're looking to reduce churn all the time. And her is a dating app, so there is a pretty well-known playbook for how engagement and retention goes there. Um, we do have the extra added challenge of having a more focused user base. So again, heavily women, queer women, and non-binary people. So. You might imagine some of the more heteronormative dating apps have a primarily male uh, paying customer base. And so we've had to kind of flip some of those playbooks on their head in order to have a strong network effect of paying and free users in the dating world. But ultimately, it's those connections that we want you to perform in the app, whether that's matching, swiping, messaging, friending, all of that good stuff that makes you not hate being single. <laughs> Uh, for my role specifically, we measure engagement as different levels of how a user interacts with the app. This is on the listener side. And then there's the creator side where we help artists um, offer merchandise and other things that help them monetize beyond royalties. What I see engagement and retention as are two inputs to what we're doing, is, and that is monetization. So if we have an engaged user base that's engaging with the art and the artists, they're more likely to monetize beyond just the subscriptions that they're paying or uh, the ads they're consuming. Yeah, for us, it's a little bit interesting because we're really diff we we're defining uh, and we are a category creator. So, you know, how many people in here have heard or likes to engage with their insurance company? Anyone? <laughs> See? Point proven. So we're really trying to redefine what that actually means. Um, and for us, really, what we look at it at a very top level is the fact that how many people are coming back and making repeat purchases and how do we enable them to live a more financially security, a secure life, essentially. And when events happen within their uh, lifetime, how are we there and how are we engaging and pulling them back into the app to show them, you know, what else they could do, or what else they could potentially purchase to live a better financially savvy um, uh, lifestyle. Um, a very simple example, for example, uh, is that when you are at an airport and you haven't bought travel insurance, we actually send you a push notification saying, Hey, Christian, you're about to take off. Don't forget to protect yourself. And here you go. You can actually buy travel insurance, a travel medical policy in less than 60 seconds uh, before you, you, you leave. So that's the kind of engagement and that's the kind of sort of retention that we focus on. Yeah, that's really good. And with 
with different audiences that you're targeting, um, I'm curious to know, how do you, I guess, how do you think that your app user needs and the behaviors are changing in, in general? And then what can you expect in the next 12 months uh, in particular to your audience and the users that you're engaging with? And we can start with, Sukri, do you want to start? Sure. I think one of the pivots that Spotify made a few years ago was expand beyond music into podcasting and now more recently into audiobooks. So we're tapping into what users need um, as an audio platform, not just the traditional music platform that we were. We're also looking at becoming more of an, a fandom destination than, than just a consumption platform, which is why you have concert tickets and you have merch now available on Spotify. So we're looking at more commerce use cases on top of a consumer first app. Okay. And for us, it's very similar to that because we are really, again, like we're, Goose is an insure tech category creator for on demand insurance, uh, for lack of better words. So when they are, when a consumer is trained for on demand services, whether it's music, dating, food, uh, shopping, how do we actually kind of deliver that, those moments of, um, delight as well as uh, meeting the expectations through for for insurance so that's a very hard thing to do considering the fact that insurance is a very legacy industry particularly so um that's the consumer behavior that we're that we're seeing that the expectations are already there and how do we continue to see um meet the expectations of uh, these consumers i have to say that dating has a very healthy churn so we have quite a lot of new people experiencing a dating app or experiencing her for the first time every month. Um, and with that, we have to speak to them in that moment, like whether they're beginning their dating journey, beginning coming out as queer, um, having a new relationship with the queer community. Her has to be very culturally relevant and not, um, not sound too old, not sound too out of touch. Uh, and the culture evolves very rapidly. So we do a lot of content strategy in order to stay seen as an authority figure on these topics. We do a lot of educational content to make sure that we're keeping people aware of how to interact and engage respectfully with each other if they're just engaging with the community. And then this year, and honestly last year as well, because of an uptick in safety concerns and hate crimes and things like that, we're having to speak to that need as well. Even though it's not an explicit service that we offer, it's not a bullet point on you know your subscription package, we have to make sure that we are cutting edge and able to prevent fraudsters, prevent um, people who might want to like spy on queer people or use these apps as like a fishing ground for whatever schemes they have. Um, so our, our consumers are increasingly uh, seeking that out and expecting that from queer spaces. So. We have to provide it. Mm -hmm. I think we're seeing um, oh, some people that are starting to be weary of subscriptions, like subscription overload, right? I have so many of them. And, um, and so in particular, like looking for consolidation, you know, so not to have just a single point solution, right? So we're, we're a heart health app. We show you detailed heart rate data that, you know, that uh, you won't see from Apple, it's there, it's underneath the covers, but um, so, you know, how do we expand to make sure we're kind of covering, you know, a bigger scope beyond just heart health? Um, so, um, and then, yeah, we're really concerned about the uncertainty in the economy and as people start to scale back on their subscriptions, right? Yeah. So that's just what I think about when I think about over the next 12 months, right? Surely. Nice. So when talking about user engagement, um, we know it's important to uh, really retain these users. Um, how effective is personalization? And how does, what does that strategy look like? Uh, and how do you approach that for, for your app? Uh, Omar, you can start. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, personalization is absolutely key when it comes to uh, insurance because everybody's needs are different. Um, if you're traveling, for example, your destination is different. Your medical health conditions are different. Uh, same goals for life insurance and other types of uh, products that we actually sell through the Goose app. So personalization kind of really sits in, in, in the core of every single, every single thing that we do 
for app engagement. Uh, we also layer it and kind of goes into the previous question as well, education as well. Um, you know, we recently did a survey with Google um, to ask people if they had $10 a month, what they would be spending it on. And avocado and toast and protecting their iPhone was the number one thing and their life was the last. So, you know, there's a lot of need for education as part of our uh, engagement strategy to be able to deliver personalized messages that are thought provoking, that um, really educates the consumer, makes them aware and kind of moves them into that purchase funnel um, uh, as well. I think for us, personalization is the bread and butter of Spotify. That's how it became the app that it did. For the, the use cases that I work on, which is monetization related, it's absolutely essential for users to already be engaged and to be either core or power users um, to monetize even more on the platform. Um, in terms of personalization for the monetization use case, what that looks like is we want to understand what kind of listener you are. Are you interested in these commerce offers? And if not, we don't want the experience to be intrusive and therefore we don't show you um, these offers or not in the same place at least. It's the, the phrase, everything is an ad network is kind of popping into my head um, where the concept being that any part of your product could be seen as an ad network where you could have a choice of what to surface, what to show in that moment, in that time, and have it be as personalized as the old ad networks used to be able to make it. Um, and now it's on us, the developers, to have that first party data to really know our users, our consumers, our customers, um, and be able to constantly run tests, constantly collect preferences in explicit and implicit ways in order to make that experience more personalized. And I think that the main line for an app like us is to not be too creepy about it. Um, we just don't want anybody feeling like um, we've overstepped in terms of personalization. So as long as there's like a very uh, easy way to explain why somebody is seeing something, personalization is the winning strategy. And it's funny you say that because as a health app, mm. we have that same kind mm -hmm. of concern, right? There, The people want to make sure that you're protecting their health data and not going too far. Um, but, you know, at the same time, we want to make sure that we tailor the content that we're pushing out to people to what they expressed interest in when they first came into the app. So, um, you know, if you, if you came into the app and you said, I'm concerned about sleep apnea and I'm pushing a bunch of educational content about hypertension, I'm probably going to lose you fast, right? Because that's not what you're there for. So yeah, that hyper-personalization is just critical all the time. Yeah. Is there any, um, Talk, talking about personalization, is there any unique strategies that uh, your app has has implemented uh, to reach maybe a specific user group or something like along those lines? Anyone free? Well, uh, I kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier that we changed our revenue model earlier this year, and I went out, I went out looking, you know, in the interwebs to find out like how do you approach this right and I really couldn't find any case studies so um, so we we went into this blind but we we used you know all of the data in our resources to communicate with you know our users and and so we didn't just say hi free user we're changing you know to premium and we're going to cut you off right we we started with you know we used a lot of psychology and we you know we said hi sue you've been a user of cardiogram since february 1st 2018 we really appreciate you being part of our family and we know that you are you know committed to you know solving your particular health need and so we really personalized all those emails reminded them of the value that we've provided as we went through, you know, that use case and made that transition over. Yeah, so it sounds like you basically made the personalization very specific to a certain date, targeting those users. Yeah, because those were all free users we were targeting, free users who in some cases had been on the app for four, five, six years. And, um, um, and so, yeah, we really wanted to personalize those emails to them because nobody likes it when you take free stuff away from them. Okay. So... We've had um, a free gift that we've been giving away for Pride. We call it Thirst Mode. So if you're thirsty, if you're in the mood to hook up, 
Uh, we make that easier for you during Pride mm -hmm. Mode because it's homophobic to charge gay people extra money during June, so don't do that. <laughs> um, but part of the umbrella is the A, LGBTQIA, asexual, aromantic. And so we actually made the choice to just suppress those gifts from that because the messaging was so over the top about being down to hook up. Um, and so we can eventually fast follow when it becomes a more monetizable product into something that is more inclusive or more personalized for that desire for friendship and connection or you know, like asexual connection. But through our testing, we knew that Thirst Mode was going to be a broad winner across the board. And in the short term, we had to use uh, targeting and segmentation to not blast those same people who might be offended or put off or discouraged by having this like shoved in their face. I think for Spotify, it's the wrapped moment is, is a big marketing moment. That's a celebration of you and your music taste. And that's always a big driver of engagement. An unusual uh, tactic that is actually from a previous company I worked at was using newest technologies. Uh, and the example that I'm going to use here is Instant Apps. That's uh, a Google framework where you can have a four megabyte or less um, version of an app that people in developing countries with phones with lower resources can just use and get a preview of what the full app experience looks like. That had a huge impact on converting those users to full app users or even in terms of our MAUs. Yeah, um, for us, like I said, you know, we do we try to use personalization in every single aspect of the customer journey. So uh, one of the things that we did when COVID happened, we were a travel insurance only uh, app. Um, so we took the time to actually pivot and launch uh, and expedite um, the launch of an other uh, verticals, including a life and accident. Um, but when we were at the tail end of COVID um, and travel was resuming, we actually utilized the same thing that Stacy mentioned, which is you've been a member with us since then. We went through really kind of giving them a landscape of what's happening in the world and really as personalized it to based on their travel habits that we actually have data on and utilize that in a personalized message. We also segment in our users based on age. We know that if you're over 60, pre-existing medical conditions for a travel insurance policy is incredibly important to you. Um, so you wanna know the coverage for that. And we know your repeat uh, pattern. We know how often you travel. So utilizing that to remind you that it's coming up or your policy is coming up for a renewal if you've bought a year. Um, let's go through your medical questions. So really kind of going through that. Um, and also on the travel aspect of side of things, uh, we utilize things like, for example, if you haven't made a claim, uh, we can get access to uh, claim information because that goes against privacy laws, but we do know if the person has made a claim or not. So we offer claim-free discounts, for example. That's a personalized token that comes in from a third-party TPA to our system that then we integrate and actually we create that personalized message. Um, Similarly for life insurance, you know, um, we if if they've put in their kids as beneficiaries of their term life, we actually say, you know, John and Lila, you know, appreciates you protecting them. You know, so we actually utilize those kind of messages to really provoke uh, some emotions, but also deliver something that is relevant to them and really, uh, you know, speaks to them. Yeah. So speaking of personalized messages, user journeys, I'm curious to know, um, what are some user journeys that you need to do right. We thinking thinking about onboarding, thinking about re-engagement, retention, et cetera. What what is something that you can tell the audience, hey, this is what we did and this is very important to being a successful app? I'll, I'll go. I think the onboarding journey is probably by far the most important because it's really your first moments that you're building a connection and 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 uh, relationship with your users, members, whatever you call them. Um, I think having that is uh, kind of down packed is the most important thing. I know um, somebody from Wealth Simple had a session this morning talking about, you know, automation and what does that look like? So I think that is very, very important. Um, it's really understanding the first seven days, three days, seven days, 14 days, 21 days. What does that look like? How do you activate a member? What are the goals that you're setting? Um, and also be able to test A-B test, change those days, change the delivery times, change your messaging, and be able to kind of figure out what works um, is, is the most important thing. Because if you miss that opportunity, uh, either either you're not gonna, if they haven't used the app, for example, on their iPhone, it's automatically gonna get 
go into the background mode and potentially uninstalled. Um, and you or they may never come back ever. So it's the onboarding is the most important piece, uh, in my opinion. Anyone have anything different? I, I mean, you, if you have not nailed onboarding, you will figure that out pretty quickly. <laughs> um, you won't have any other users in the rest of your experiments. Um, I was at a seed stage place last year and we like luckily had enough users to test on, but it was so much, took so much more cost and resources to really iterate on our, on our onboarding, even though we had enough volume to do all of these tests. Um, and I would just say that if onboarding is where your test needs to be run, make sure that you have like really strong experiment leaders prioritizing that, um, from day one, like never waste a single day, not having learnings or tests running, uh, because you will regret having like wasted that bucket of users and not not using them to figure out just a little bit more about what your customers want or don't want. I've got to totally agree. Onboarding is like the number one um, because it's a 30 day trial app. Also, I really need them. You know, I'm paying attention to what they're doing on day one and day three and day seven, just like Omar said, because I want to hit the day 30 mark and I want them to still be engaged with the app so that they start producing revenue for me. So critical. I would say onboarding, yes, but then keeping users retained, which is more of a binary metric. They're either retained or they're not. And then engagement is where you could really have tiers of this is a casual user, this is a regular user, and this is a power user. And how you get those users to make that journey is is by giving users a delightful experience. This is how much ever you use the app, it just keeps getting better every time. Um, and that's the beauty of personalization, that I would yeah. say. The core experience more than onboarding because you set those expectations and you just keep getting better and surprising them with even better experiences. Very good. With with metrics, I think it looks like the audience is putting some questions in and they really want to move on to the KPIs and metrics. So what are things that you're measuring um, that's important to, to your brand and um, what does that mean? Mm. Uh, dating, again, I will say... The playbooks are out there, but in terms of engaging with other people in the network, that's a big one. And so whatever features we have that allow them to do that, we're looking for that in terms of healthy core experience. Um, there are differences between paying users and free users and things like that. And so we've had the chance to use that data to increase and decrease like the caps on certain things. You can imagine... If you've been on a dating app, if you're on the free experience, sometimes you run out of unlimited messages or unlimited swipes or things like that. And those are moments we come in and find that timing of maybe they'd be motivated to upgrade to a more premium experience. Um, and knowing how people like that average behavior across different segments works allows us to offer them that upsell. Um, but at the end of the day, like we're a cash flow business, which I haven't been in a lot of apps that can say that. And so we're looking for ways to keep ourselves growing in a healthy way. Yeah, I would agree with that as well. I think for us, from a top line perspective, we kind of look at um, just the sheer number of how many days or years you have been still active with us and continuing to come back. I think that's just a very top line vanity metric, but really gives you a strong signal of your overall app retention rate. Um, we also look at activation rate at a, at a, for a particular time, uh, and we cohort them accordingly. So what is the activation rate to purchasing your first policy, for example? Uh, how many days does that look? Um, and then, um, again, kind of focusing on being running a healthy business, we're also focused on repeat uh, purchase rate as well as cross-sell. So, um, you know, if Taylor signed up for, for Goose on travel insurance, how do we cross-sell her to a life insurance product? How do we cross sell her to a, um, a pet insurance product and so on and so forth. So looking at that and diversifying that um, is also an important trigger and a business metric for us to really have a gauge of our uh, engagement and retention rates. You're going to send me a pet? I don't know. <laughs> there you go. Well, you might get one by the end of this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, when I think about the second part of the question, is there such a thing as measuring too much? 
in my opinion, no. You know, every so I didn't have a, a good strong analytics app that wasn't in my budget. So I am Google Sheets, and so on a weekly basis, I would go out to um, to CleverTap, who is my CMS, and I would collect data from there. I went to both app stores and collected data from there. I went to Apps Flyer. I went to all the sources, my internal database as well, and I would pull daily data in on a weekly basis. And with every, I wouldn't say every week I added more data, but certainly every month, I got really fast, mm -hmm. right? Like I can do all that data collection in about uh, a little over an hour, but that gave me more and more insights into what was working. Um, and so I don't think you can measure too much. Um, I think it just teaches you more about what engagement, what's working for retention. But can you sleep too little? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it also really depends in terms of what is the overall business objective and what is the core KPI that you're delivering towards. Um, I think there is such thing as analysis paralysis, and sometimes we can go through the rabbit hole as well, especially if we are testing different things. Like, you know, for us, we actually test the button colors in the email. Um, you know, not necessarily just the positioning, but even the color from a conversion optimization perspective. So like, you know, if you're doing it for a particular test and, you know, it's just at a campaign level, it's fine. But if you're going to do that in every single piece of communication you send out, you're never going to have time to one, analyze, two, digest it, three, actually do something about it. So, you know, you got to always remember if it's actionable insight, track it. If it's not actionable, you really, at some point, you just have to learn to let go. Very true. Um, I'm curious to know if uh, some of these metrics that you're tracking are shared across the org, not specifically to your function. I mean, mine are. I mean, I had a weekly meeting with the leadership team to just review, you know, metrics and um, because not only did I collect all the, all the daily data, but then I sliced it and diced it every which way, all automated, right? So this wasn't me like having to go in and do all these calculations, but I automated these spreadsheets so that the leadership team could really understand what was working or when we, when we had a jump in users, right? I would make notes so we could explain why and what happened. And, um, and a lot of it too, because you want to be able to explain the changes, if you look at June of this year versus June of last year, well, we've got to remember that June of last year, we did this experiment that may, had a big impact on us. And so it's not that this June is down, it's that that June was up for a unique set of circumstances. So this at a big company can be slightly tricky sometimes because some orgs are working on their own KPIs, which may or may not be at odds with other orgs KPIs there's limited real estate, especially on mobile. So that's why having shared metrics and shared goals is extremely important when you're working on surfaces that are shared and owned by dozens of teams sometimes. Yeah, for us, I mean, we're a much smaller company than Spotify, uh, but we can dream, right? Um, <laughs> so for us, every single person has access to um, all the campaign data, financials, personal, like any kind of data that, you know, that we can share in a report uh, format. Everybody has, and everybody's a stakeholder, so it's imperative for them to know how their work is contributing to particular KPIs that we're trying to hit. So, um, yeah. Yeah, that's just a good, healthy organization where people at many levels share a goal and understand that even though sometimes it can feel at odds, you're all on the same team. At the end of the day, at the end of the quarter, you're all driving towards the same thing. And honestly, like, as I've gotten more mature in my career, being able to speak that language and understand the shared goals of the org gives me the leverage to get tools like CleverTap because that's a that you know that can be pricey if you have like decent MAUs and as a dating app we do. Um, so we it's good for the leadership and it's good for the lifecycle marketers to really understand what is worth investing in. All right. So it's basically what you're saying is it's really important that cross functionally you should be somewhat aligned and be communicative throughout your, your organization. That's great. Um, let's talk about uh, retention. I think that's a, a big one in this, in this game that we play. Um, what are some of the main challenges uh, 
managing retention right now? And then what, av what advice can you offer to those who might be struggling with that? Uh, that's a big question. <laughs> yeah, I, I will say that you know, from from the, going back to that experience uh, that we had of changing revenue models, you know, we first you want to look at you know when you're a young app. Of course, we wanted people, <laughs> we wanted warm bodies downloading the app, using the app. You know, we wanted to to look at MAU and make sure that was a nice solid number. But then at some point, we realized, are those free users really providing us any value? You know, once we had enough users to have the data to be able to, you know, do our machine learning models, um, did we really need those free users and what value were they adding to us? And so, you know, that was a hard decision to make to, you know, cut loose essentially, you know, 175,000 users, you know, but were those users providing us with value? And they weren't because there was no revenue associated with them. So um, now I didn't cut them out of my database, right? So I can still reach out to them periodically and re-engage with them and, you know, remind them of what was important to them. And there may be a time when they come back to us. Right. Yeah, similarly for us, I mean, it's, it's really important the type of customer you have and um, we, every single company and organization struggles with churn. I mean, it exists, right? So there isn't one that doesn't have, I think understanding what is an acceptable churn for your vertical, for your category and for your businesses, um, and then kind of basing off your decisions off of that is, is very, very important. Um, for us, similarly, you know, do we really want customers who continue to fail on their monthly insurance payments, uh, and their credit cards, for example, don't process, um, um, do we really want that type of customer? So I think it's a, it's it, what Stacy right said. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, for us, you know, having a healthy retention rate is very, very important, obviously. Um, but with that being said, we do benchmark it based on the policy type holder, the 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 region they're in, the age bracket they're in, and understanding the overall churn rate at that level is 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 what we measure. Mm. Um, with, with dating, there's the chicken egg problem. Yeah. Problem. So every time we enter a new market, a new country, like we do have to hit critical mass and then maintain it through, you know, as best we can through retention tactics. Um, and then there is like a a point that you do reach where they are retaining each other. The users are the best retention tactic that we can have. So it can be that expensive upfront getting people in. Um, and then fostering brand recognition and word of mouth and not just performance marketing um, because positive interactions with other people on the app are our biggest signal that they're achieving their goals when they came to a dating app. Um, there are challenges in how to, as the brand and as the product, inject yourself into those interactions, right? So Sometimes we have things like conversation starters. Maybe you're feeling a little shy and like not opening up to people. Um, there's things that we can nudge people along that journey to have those healthy and happy interactions. But again, not being too creepy, not being too personalized, all of that. I do think retention is, is more of an output than an input. Uh, and that's how it should be treated. The question says it feels overwhelming. That's probably because it's not broken down into the pieces that it needs to. So are you acquiring the right types of users, as everyone here has said? And then are you activating them? Are they doing the core action on your app that you have defined as the core problem you're solving? If not, you're either not solving the right problem or you're not acquiring the right, right types of users. So I would focus on either of those, uh, figure out which one it is and, and focus on, on solving the, that problem first. And retention shouldn't necessarily just be measured, in my opinion, based on retention rate or churn rate. It should also, we should also look at other metrics like CAC to LTV ratio. You know, are you meeting your LTV goals? What is your CAC on this? Are, or like, is that a positive number? Hopefully so, because you're in deep trouble if you have, you know, high churn rate uh, and low LTV to CAC ratio. That's when the overwhelming should really start. But if you have a good LTV to CAC ratio, you're starting to hit your LTV values. You may have, you know, higher churn rate, but maybe there's some things that you could do about it to really um, get in the retention rate higher, then then I wouldn't feel so overwhelmed uh, about it. But the alarm bells should go off 
if those two numbers are, you know, going in the opposite direction, which is LTV to CAC ratio down and your churn rate high. Are there any um, main user channels, I guess, like in talking about user journeys, is there any main channel that you, your company or your brand kind of lean towards, whether it's in-app, whether it's push, email, et cetera? Uh, okay, so I have a very just, I have a very strong opinion on this, right? So I always have my team start with a piece of long form content. So something like a blog post, right? Because once I have that blog post written, I can use that for SEO, SEM on my website. And then that piece of content goes into a database. So it's then available for me to create emails, push notifications, in-app messages. So I always take that strategy because it's a one-time investment to create the long form piece of content that then I can reuse year after year in multiple campaigns. Um, and, and then we're also very consistent about our messaging we try to stay science-based, so I want to make sure I'm always, you know, citing my sources and things like that. So that's that's my very strong opinion on on content. I love that. I want to see your database. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for us, we it's a it's a multi-channel approach as well. Um, one because of which segment and cohort of customers respond to each channel differently. Um, if you know, some of our segments do like long form content. So sending them an email makes sense. Um, some, some cohorts don't. Um, so we actually test that, but also every single channel has its limitations. So, um, email, you got to manage your domain and IP reputation, uh, push notification. You're going to look at your opt-in rate SMS. You could easily get, um, um, uh, rated as spam. Sorry. So uh, there's different, like you got to look at all the different channels and how do you manage a healthy sort of uh, operational KPI on this, so, you know, making sure that your domain reputation is high, um, you know, you're not getting constantly dinged for spam on SMS, uh, your push notification opt-in rate is at a decent level as much as possible. So there's things that you got to do on that side as well to be able to see the true value of across uh, platform messaging. Yeah. As long as you understand what your users want to use you for, mm -hmm. I think it can be helpful to align the message with the channel. Um, and so you can imagine we have a pretty high opt-in rate on notifications because that's very uh, helpful and practical to be able to be notified when someone is messaging you or matching with you. Um, so we can selectively amplify other important brand or product messages through there but it's so small, it's such a very tiny amount of real estate. And we love to be cheeky, we love to be bold, we love to like push push the boundaries in ways that other apps wouldn't necessarily do so because it's like too risky for their brand. Um, but that takes like a lot of like back and forth of how do you hit that message exactly right when you only have this many characters and then round it out with other longer form things, whether that's video or memes or blog posts or op-eds. Um, we did a campaign in April for Lesbian Visibility Day. And on our blog, we went super serious with it. We like took a really bold stance about what it means to be lesbian in this day and age. Um, and then our, our CEO self-taped like a really nice personal message to all of our users voicing solidarity and inclusivity and then with push we went like snappy and aggressive and provocative and got those click-through rates like nice and nice and high and then they like stumbled onto a more thoughtful message mm -hmm. um so i think that if you have the trust of your users and and you're giving them something valuable to engage with at the right time um, you have a lot of freedom to use those mediums creatively I think for um, for us, it's more about being thoughtful about user preferences, both explicit and implicit. So we know what kind of notifications you have clicked on before. We know what kind of messaging you're more interested in. Are you interested in concert tickets when you talked about this before? Getting a push notification about that versus a new release. Taking those implicit signals and also explicit signals, which is granularly letting users decide what kinds of notifications they want to receive and respecting that boundary. Very good. Um, looks like that we have some popular questions on Slido if uh, we want to answer that. I think one thing that is interesting is 
uh, the third one, the, I guess the one that's talking about, are you seeing any convergence of classic CRM, lifecycle marketing, and more product-driven use cases like A-B testing or feature flagging? And if so, are, are, you, are, you, are you doing that within your app already? Yeah, I mean, we're consist consistently doing A-B testing to kind of figure out, you know, um, what is the uh, path to uh, least resistance, but in a more positive way and, you know, um, delight the customer of the experience because, yes, we are an app first, insurance second kind of approach. We are trying to make insurance more accessible, affordable, but also give it a, a personality. We don't take ourselves too seriously. Um, so for us, we're consistently trying um, different ways to do A-B testing to kind of overcome that, you know, um, blue banner insurance company of so, so and so, you know, kind of stigma and really kind of build a, uh, an exciting brand. And even in our language, in terms of how we, we say it, we welcome everybody to the flock, um, you know, and, and we say, don't forget to cover your tail feathers. You know, like we just have fun with it. And when we're sending even push notifications, we use a lot of um, multimedia approach, you know, including Giphy's and uh, cool images, fun images that really makes it personalized, but also makes it um, uh, kind of fun. Um, that also helps us in retaining our opt-in rates for push notification, because believe it or not, some people love receiving that and kind of makes them chuckle. So there you go. Huh. Um, but yeah, it's and we do consistently A-B test to kind of see the conversions, but also to see the results. I read this question as like, organizationally, are the people who were once just life cycle specialists and the people who were product A-B testers, are they coming together now? Are they the same person now? And I, again, I've been in a lot of like smaller or medium sized orgs where you're already the same person, you're already wearing a lot of hats. Um, so it's a very natural thing for someone who did life cycle for like nine months last year is like going into paywall testing for a four month uh, series. Um, so I think that it's it's a very similar skill set. I think it makes sense to have people who can move around within your organization to where your business needs the most muscle. Um, and I've definitely seen it at a bunch of the smaller orgs I worked at. So never get too specialized if you plan to stay in startups. Oh. Any other thoughts? Perfect. So I know we have a couple of minutes left. Um, we, can, we can land this plane. Hopefully this was really um, thoughtful and provoking some really good thoughts about how the ways you can engage your users, thinking about engagement and retention. So I'd love to hear maybe what would be like your top tip for the audience of for a successful and app engagement strategy. I know there's going to be a lot of like, there's a lot of strategy involved when we talk about this, but maybe something that you've seen success in your own app. I think if you can focus on your onboarding, if you haven't already done so and try to uh, layer in as much personalization as you possibly can, um, that would be, that would be the key thing. That would be the top tip that I would give somebody. I think for me, it would be really get to know your your target customers and solve important problems that are important to them, and the rest takes care of itself. Yeah. Yeah. Two-way conversation. You're not just blasting them. You have to find a way to listen. Yeah, and I would say mine is um, don't be afraid to ask your user base for help oh. in solving a problem. So, you know, some of the highest engagement we ever had was when we pushed out surveys asking them for information about, you know, how, how they were feeling post COVID, right? Or, um, or we're, we're doing, we're working on, you know, a new algorithm for migraines. And so when we reached out and we asked our users to support us in helping them, they, the, you know, the engagement rates were just through the roof. Well, that concludes our time. Uh, I'd like to give an uh, applause to our guests here. If you have any other questions, feel free to reach out. We'll be in the lobby and hanging out. So mm -hmm. thank you.